Hi, my name is Dr. Brent Mattingly, and I'm an associate professor and chair of the psychology department at Ursinus College. I'm excited to hear that you're interested in Ursinus, and I hope that you'll join us in the fall semester. I wanted to take just a moment to introduce some of the members of my department uh, so that they can introduce themselves and tell you the kinds of work they do. I'll actually begin. So I'm a social psychologist, and what I study is primarily the intersection of one's self and identity and relationships. Particularly, I study romantic relationships, though I've done research on friendships. So what this means is I'm interested in how individuals' identities are shaped through the initiation, formation, maintenance of relationships. So for instance, how individuals' sense of who they are and their, their way in which they understand themselves changes as they form close relationships with others. Not only do I examine this at the formation, initiation, and maintenance stages of relationships, I'm also interested to see what happens to individuals' identities, their sense of self, upon the breakup of relationships, because not only is that a distressing time, but it potentially has implications for their self-concept. Hi, my name is Sue Lawrence. Uh, my research at Orsinus has been dealing with loss and grief, especially traumatic grief in childhood and how it's affected people both at the time and later on. So we've been surveying and interviewing college students who've gone through that kind of an experience and asked them their, what have they have felt, thought, and gone through in their life. Uh, we've also been dealing with educators and asking them about what we can do to help them better support grieving children. So if, if you're interested in that topic, um, we'd be happy to have you join my group at Ursinus. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren McCook and I'm a faculty member in the psychology department and in the neuroscience program. And I'm interested in looking at how our experiences during early development influence behaviors um, throughout the lifespan. So for example, right now I'm focusing on how exposure to high or low nurturing environments during early, early postnatal development influence behaviors such as social behaviors, several different types of learning and memory, and anxiety into adulthood. Hi, I'm Joel Bish. I'm an associate professor at Ursinus. I'm in the psychology department in the neuroscience program. My research interests are generally in the field of concussions. I use uh, neuropsychological profiles and testing and assessments as well as EEG brain recording um, and a few other techniques to try and investigate long-term effects of the concussions, uh, mostly related to cognitive decline and some of the deficits that last a long time. Um, this research has been going on for a while and a lot of students work in my lab and regularly get published, regularly get present presentations at conferences and uh, I enjoy working with the students a lot in this research field. Um, that's it. Again, have a great time. Bye, Frankie. Bye -bye. Hi, I'm Kathy Chambliss. This research project has been exploring depression and its interpersonal correlates. For a long time, we've understood that people with depression view their own successes and failures differently from people without depression. What we were interested in was whether people with depression also view other people's successes and failures differently. What we found was that individuals with more depressive symptoms scored higher in schadenfreude and lower in something that we dubbed freudenfreude. Schadenfreude involves taking pleasure and actually sometimes delight in the misery and failures and setbacks of other people. Not a very nice thing. Freudenfreud refers to kind of the flip side of that, really enjoying it when other people bring you their successes and delights. When people with depression show their high level of schadenfreude and lower levels of Freudenfreud, we really suspect it could be toxic to their relationships. That could leave them lonelier, exacerbating their depressive symptoms. So we were interested in trying to figure out if there's anything that we could do about this. So we developed something that we call Freud and Freud Enhancement Training. It aims at improving the interpersonal mutuality of people with depressive symptoms. We, in Freud and Freud Enhancement Training, 
try to teach people to go out of their way to notice and respond positively and ask for all the details when their friends and family members bring them experiences with success. We also teach people how to package their bragging with gestures of gratitude to temper the competitive juices that often get tripped off when people share their successes with one another. What we found is after only two weeks of this Freud and Freud enhancement training, depressive symptoms went down, mood went up, and the quality of relationships improved in ways that were measurable. We were pretty excited because the people in the Freud and Freud enhancement training group improved at levels greater than those receiving a treatment as usual condition that involved active listening training. So we were pretty excited about that. We were even more excited when one of the studies that we published was picked up by researchers in Poland who asked if we'd be interested in working with them to replicate our findings. We certainly were happy to do so and what they did was they worked with both a clinical and a non-clinical population and found the same relationship that we'd observed. Higher levels of schadenfreude and lower levels of freudenfreude among the people diagnosed with depression. Uh, in kind of the last year, what we've done is gone in a slightly different direction. We've been looking at how mobile device use oftentimes can end up being toxic to interpersonal relationship quality. We found that 97% of people complain that their female friends often end up getting distracted by mobile devices during face-to-face -face encounters. And many people complain that it compromises the experience of empathy and interpersonal relationships. When we went to a nursing home, we found that many of the elderly complained that their children and their grandchildren get lost on their cell phones during visits. One of the things that we're interested in doing is articulating the potential social hazards associated with mobile device use so that young people appreciate that even though within their generation mobile device consulting is considered pretty acceptable, among the older age cohorts, it's really experienced as rude. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Professor Mora Renka, and maybe just like you, I'm going to be joining the Asinus community in the fall. I'm going to be coming in as a new professor of psychology. I'm what we call a health psychologist, which means that I'm interested in how our experiences affect our health behaviors and, in turn, our health itself. Specifically, I'm interested in individuals who have been the target of prejudice and discrimination. For these people, how does experiencing discrimination end up manifesting in their body? How do they deal with that stress physically? And afterwards, how do they cope with it? I'm really excited to be joining the Asinus community next year. Um, they've been absolutely wonderful to me so far. Just super welcoming um, and really open, even before I've stepped foot on campus. So I'm really excited about it, and I hope you join us next year too.